world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, Mariska. Sorry to bother you. You're on mute. So if you could start over, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's let's try that again. Thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. Hello, USA Global TV and Radio listeners and watchers on our various platforms. My name is Mariska Dupria, and you are joining us today for a Talking Head show. And we are continuing on our journey to look at how we can build great teams. And of course, we started with this journey last week. So we looked at what is a team and how to determine what do we need? Do we, do we just need a group? Do we need a team? Do we need a collaboration? What exactly is it that we need within that space? And this week, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into how to actually build our high-performing team. And without further ado, let me get my slides sorted out. Okay, so building trust is the theme of our lesson for today. Now, last time around, we saw that building teams can be a little bit of a obstacle course, course sometimes with all sorts of twists and turns, and we're not always too sure where to go. In the end, hopefully, we do get to have a high-performing team. The thing is, though, we don't want to leave it up to chance. We actually want to do this intentionally, as we would remember from our lessons in attention. Intention is paramount to make sure that we actually hit the goal or the target that we are aiming for. And that would be exactly the same thing for building high performing teams. So. Last time round, we saw that a high-performing team, to build them, we need to have trust. We need to have some form of conflict, hopefully healthy ones. Um, we need to have commitment. We need to have accountability. And then, of course, we need to have some focus on the results that we are driving towards. So one formula that I want us to think about when we think about working with teams and cultivating the team that we want is there's no good teams and bad teams and that's just the way they are we actually cultivate them we grow them and what we need as individuals to be able to do this is there's a little formula for it teamwork equals courage and persistence so we need those two elements throughout the whole process, and then we will be able to cultivate a high-performing team. Now, these two, definitely lots of courage. I'm suspecting persistence will pay off in the end, um, and they will get the trapeze act perfect. Not sure where that's going at the moment yet. 
So making sure that we utilize the courage and persistence in our own teams. Let's see how we do this. How do we actually build trust in a team? What does it look like? What do we even need to know about trust in teams? So one of the elements that's really important for us within a team is to have that emotional safety. So you might have heard of people talking about psychological safety, um, being emotionally aware. So there's a, a lot of things around emotional safety, the way that we create it. And we will look at some of that today. And then being vulnerable, of course, that's part of that emotional safety. Vulnerability for most people, we don't like it. We try to avoid it. Um, if we did something wrong, we don't want to admit to it. So that vulnerability and showing that, hey, I'm human and it's okay and everybody makes mistakes, it's actually a great way to build trust in a team. So this can look like admitting mistakes, sharing our fears, saying when we don't know or when we are scared about something, um, talking about our strengths and our weaknesses because we all have them. We're not strong in everything. We're also not weak in everything. So we have a combination of the two and understanding what it is to help ourselves and our team members goes a long way to building trust in our team. And then, of course, addressing any behaviors where team members might be doing stuff that they shouldn't or that might be grading the team for one reason or another. So knowing that this is what trust looks like within a team um, as we we find it out we will then deep uh, dive a bit deeper there you go into specific elements that can actually help us cultivate these things because just saying hey be emotionally safe well how do i do that how how does that show up in my team? Do I need to share all my biggest, darkest secrets? Is that what's required? Hopefully not, uh, because I'm, I'm seeing most of you guys cringe just by me mentioning that. So no, we don't want you to share all your deepest, darkest secrets immediately with all your team members. That's not what we're looking for. Um, what we are looking for, though, is to see whether we have the attributes within our team as well as the strengths that we require to do the thing that we need to do. And being able to assess these. Because in teams, the teams that I've worked in, sometimes we will go into a situation. I had a team where I was the new leader in that team. So the team was already established and I had to step in. So the team was the team, right? I got, I got the people I got. And we needed to figure out how to make this work. In other situations, it might be that, and I also had this before, where I was the leader and I had to build a team around me. So I needed to figure out, so what is it exactly that this team will look like? How will we determine what it is, looking at what we need to do, how we want to do that, the type of attributes, the challenges that we might face, what is it that we needed for that team in order to establish a team that would work well? And then, of course, getting the people in that would be able to perform those functions. And then, of course, there is the more soft skills within our team trust building. And this is the emotional bits that I know, especially for engineers that I work with, they're not fans. Um, so things that would come into this is our listening, our caring, our empathy. So we will look at the attributes and the strengths as one and then dive a bit deeper into the listening, caring and empathy on its own. 
So the team, right. We have a team, maybe we have an already established team, maybe we have a team that's been working together for a long time, or maybe this is a team that is brand new and they don't know each other from a bar of soap. What is it that we need to look at? So firstly, what, why do we have the team, right? So going back to our first lesson, determining what it is that we need this team to do. So what do we want to accomplish as a team? Now, this can be a variety of different things. So for each team, it is going to be very individual. Then next, of course, the thing that we, most of us, first think of is skill sets. I need to build a house and for that, I need a builder and I need a plumber and I need an electrician. <laughs> Straightforward. So skill sets, normally for most of us, it's easy to identify. It is the job the person do. It is a task or outcome. There's something very tangible about skill sets that we can easily identify. The place that trips us up is attributes. Now, attributes, when we think about attributes, these are things such as would this team member perform well under pressure? Would this team member um, think about the risks involved? Now, these type of things are also very individual. Some people think about risk all the time. Some people don't think of about it at all, right? Um, they, they're not even worried about it. It doesn't cross their mind. Now, say we need to establish a team of firefighters. Do we need them to think about risk? Well, in all likelihood, yes, we do need them to think about risk because they're going into burning buildings, right? They are trying to save other people's lives. There needs to be some form of risk assessment within them when they're doing the work that they're doing. Do we need them to be go-getters? Do we need them to be strategic thinkers? Do we need them to look at a building and see other options, so problem solving of some sort? Thinking about these things within the the work or the task that the team needs to perform will help us to identify the attributes that the person need. So we preferably do not want somebody that's going to faint at the first sight of blood because that won't be ideal when they're inside the building, right? We need people that can work under pressure because normally when a building is burning there's a lot of pressure right then with the skill set we need people that is physically strong because trust me i have rolled some of those fire hoses out they are not light so those sort of things we need to take into consideration when we're looking at the skills that should be fairly easy right the person's going to be trained they will have some specific skill sets, and then the attributes, making sure that that actually works well. I remember being on our first response team, and there was a lady that also joined us on the first response team, and during training, no problem whatsoever. We actually had practice. We didn't know it was a practice run. Uh, it was one of those practice drills where well, let's jump into it and see what happens. And what happened was she fainted. Wasn't great. So we don't want to put somebody in a position where we're setting them up for failure. We want them to succeed. We want them to be great team members because that's going to help the rest of the team. And then, of course, looking at our current team, do we have any gaps? Or do we maybe have a lot of people in one area that with one set of attributes, but we need somebody else with another set of attributes to balance it out a little bit? And 
what would give us an indication to re-evaluate our team? Because sometimes circumstances, environments, things like that change. And as they change, we need to adapt to it. And going back to this to see whether do we still have the skill sets that we require and do we still have the attributes that we require. So making sure that we look at both. Then we hopefully have a team assembled that looks something like this and not something like that. Right. Don't want everybody to look the same even though they don't look the same, possibly same attributes. So moving from the attributes and looking at how to assemble our team to build the trust, the physical getting that trust within the team. So we said there's listening, there's caring, and then, of course, there's empathy. So let's start with listening. Now, listening... We can go back to some of the other exercises in our communication series. There is a little bit more about listening in those. Um, I've also today gotten a little bit of an exercise for you. So we can practice good listening skills. So within our teams and this is listening specifically to start building trust now listening in general helps us to build trust this specific exercise is focused on building trust so asking a team member an open-ended question now an open question is a question that starts with what or where or when or who preferably not why it only gives us reasons or how Right, that's open questions. The best one is a what question. Because a what question really makes it open for a person to explore. For instance, what is a fun activity that you enjoy over weekends? Right, person can answer it. But when you listen to that question, it has a tendency to have a very short answer because maybe the person only has one thing that they enjoy. So we can put the question a little bit different, still thinking about things that they enjoy and say something, for instance, like, what do you enjoy doing? So not saying weekends, not saying holidays, just what do you enjoy doing? A lot open, a lot more open. So open questions first. Right. Then really listen to the answer. Not, I mean, they enjoy doing this thing, right? So it's not whether we enjoy doing it, they enjoy doing it. And we want to find out and understand more about why maybe they enjoy doing it. What about it is enjoyable to them? because we want to find out more about the person. This is about building trust, remember? So keep quiet and listen to the answer. Then when they've stopped speaking, most of us jump in with either a comment or another question. Count five in your head. That was about five. So when you count five in your own head, normally what would happen with other people is they will start talking again. Because for some odd reason, we love filling the silence. So counting five in our own heads gives the other person an opportunity to add more if they feel like adding more. If they haven't spoken, then we can start to speak and maybe ask the next question. So that would help us to cultivate this listening that would help us with building more trust. So 
moving from listening and going into the caring, how do we show we care? Right. So one of it, and that's why we started with the listening, is asking questions in order to understand. Not to solve a problem, not to prove the other person wrong, not to do all the other things that we sometimes do when we're asking questions. Ask it to understand the other person, where they're looking from, what it is that they're seeing. Because even though we all think we might look from the same place, we often don't. So asking questions in order to understand, it helps us to show that we care. Then also checking in with them as a human being. So there's a lot of times that we work, we do a whole bunch of things at work, and we will talk to our colleagues about, well, work, right? It's the one thing we have in common. When we show we care, we also ask about other things, how they are as a human being. We don't need to ask about their family. We don't need to ask about how the dog is doing. Yes, you can if you feel like it. You don't have to. It is about the individual right in front of you. No one else. So if they bring up the dog or the family, great. Then that's part of the conversation that they want to have. But it is about that person, that individual, as a human. Are they okay? How are they feeling? Are they still coping? That sort of thing. Then showing appreciation. Now, there is a lovely study that they did, and they came up with the five love languages. Now, in the workplace, five love languages doesn't sound like something that we can easily talk about, but we can change it into appreciation language. So understanding what the person enjoys to be appreciated. So how do they enjoy being appreciated? Do they enjoy it when we say it to them? Do they enjoy it when we show it to them with a gift, maybe a token of appreciation? Do they enjoy it when we spend time with them, really listen to them? And that's a show of appreciation. So everybody gets appreciated differently and understanding how our team members enjoy to be appreciated helps us to show that we care in a language appropriate for them, not for us. And then, of course, asking whether they need or require any support. Now, when I'm saying support, I don't mean take the work that they're doing and you go and do it. That's definitely not what support is. Support is helping them to perform the task. It might be that um, there's a lot of red tape for whatever reason. I recall projects where we had quite a bit of red tape and my direct manager couldn't even solve it. We had to escalate it quite a few levels. So that is support that I required in order for me to perform my work. And if my manager didn't ask, I might have taken a little bit longer to get things sorted out. So what sort of support do your team members require in order for them to perform the functions that they need to perform and also to feel supported? Again, this is one of those things that it's not going to be the same for everybody and it's not always going to stay the same. So we need to continuously ask. And then for empathy, I thought I would show you a little video.
So now knowing and understanding the difference between empathy and sympathy, I want us to think about how often we communicate sympathy and not empathy. And listening, the way we practiced listening a little bit earlier, with the caring helps us to get closer to the empathy. So those are the main elements or main ingredients that we use to build trust within a team. And Phil Jackson said that the strength of the team is in each member. And the strength of each member is in the team. So to wrap up our um, lesson for today, the two questions that we can continuously think about is what skills and attributes does our team need so that we make sure that we have all the things in our team that's required for the task? And how are you and your team creating trust? And if you forget how to do that, you can always come back to this lesson. If you would like more information or just to connect to have a chat, you can get hold of me on my website, which is journey to the number two discover.com, or alternatively, email me, Mariska at journey to again the number two discover.com, or I would love to connect with you via LinkedIn. Just write me a little message and we are sure to be able to connect and start the conversation. And with that, for today, that is the end of our lesson on trust. Next time round, we will go one further and look at conflict and how to create healthy conflict for our teams to become high performing teams. Thank you very much and until next time, bye.